of our show. We're streaming live on LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter, and uh, I think on Twitch. So welcome, and I'm looking forward to our guest today, and I'm going to pass it to Marielle, who's going to introduce the show, and let's get this thing going. Uh, hi guys, my name is Maria Navarro. I'm broadcasting live from one of our nearest locations in Chihuahua, New Mexico. Uh, joining today, we have our host, uh, Carl Ponce and Tulus Regina. Thank you very much for joining us to another edition of, of Dr. Life. Uh, today, we have Heidi Helfen at Procore, um, and we are going to be talking about ways to get better at it while scaling our company. Heidi, thank you very much for, for joining us today. Hi, Marielle. Uh, hi, everyone. So great to be here. Uh, hi, well, first off, um, I think our audience would like to know a little bit about, about yourself, how you started out Procore. Sure. Uh, my name is Heidi Helfand. Yeah. So I've been in the software industry about 20 years, working at different startups that have grown into larger companies. Uh, the first one was called Expert City. We invented GoToMeeting and GoToWebinar. We were acquired by Citrix. Uh, the second startup that I was at called Appfolio, I was the 10th employee at that company, which makes software, uh, workflow software for property management companies and law firms. I was there until I think we were about 650 people. Then I became a consultant. And when I was consulting, I discovered this wonderful company called Procore Technologies. And at Procore, we're really changing the world of construction. So we build software for construction professionals and are really improving the lives of people in construction. And we have a mission to connect everyone in construction to our global platform. So we offer a variety of products from construction project management, uh, some tools for the job site. You can uh, see some awesome 3D rendering, 3D models of your construction site, some 2D tools where you can be on the job site, look at the plans. I love the idea of taking photos of what you've built and attaching them to the plans, um, variety of things. So I work in uh, R&D operations and my title is Director of Engineering Excellence. I work with across all teams in R&D and do a variety of internal coaching about how we can get better at building software, how we can pursue excellence. And uh, yeah, so glad to be here. Oh, I, I guess I should also say I'm an author. <laughs> author of the book Dynamic Reteaming, which is all about how we can get better at growing, changing, and morphing our companies, because uh, our teams will change, it's inevitable. So how can we lean into that and get really good at managing uh, change in teams? So. Well, thank you, Hattie. So, well, yeah. do you have uh, various, uh, you've been part of various teams, you have, uh, uh, we have written a book, Dynamic Reteaming. So you have quite a lot of experience uh, doing this, helping teams grow. Um, how long have you been focusing on, on helping teams? Like, I know that you probably started an, an, a company doing what you, you went to college for, but when was the, the, the time that you realized that this is what you like, that you wanted to help other teams, other people grow? Yeah, so I think it was back at the first startup that I was at, Expert City, and then you know we, we became Citrix. And I worked on all of the new product development on the engineering side. I was uh, helping manage projects, uh, technical project management, and I grew, grew a group there. So I was always on the engineering side, partnering with our teammates in product development and really working with the teams to catalyze these products from nothing. I'm very, very proud of everything that we built at Expert City and Citrix, go to meeting, go to webinar, go to my PC. Those are all projects, uh, all products that I worked on from the very beginning. So just that act of creation with a team of amazing things out of nothing was very motivating to me. So it's it's been a number of years. Uh, and then I kind of shifted more into a coaching stance and Lean Software Development XP stance at the second startup app, Folio, where they hired me in. And, uh, you know, I worked from the first team there and helped that company scale out to more than uh, 30 teams, I believe it was, in my time there. And so it's been it's been a number of years, I don't know, probably 15 years focused on the teams. Uh, before that, I had roles in interaction design as part of a web development team. Prior to that, I was 
a web editor and working on different sorts of copy and technical writing for uh, our first products at Expert City. So it's been a really fun ride. Heidi, I'm curious to learn, uh, what are some key things you've, you've discovered uh, when it comes to uh, improving the way organizations uh, deal with uh, teamwork, specifically in companies that are growing and scaling pretty rapidly? Have you noticed anything in particular from those who do it better than others that you could share with us? Sure. I, I think one of the keys to successful teams is fostering relationship building and community building in the teams. I really have always felt that if we take the time to try to know each other, everything else is easier. It's almost like a keystone habit that leads to good things in other areas. So I've always, uh, you know, also thought about like deliberate getting to know you type activities. There's a activity I love to do. I've been doing it for years. I learned it from Lisa Atkins. I always talk about it because it's just still so impactful to me because it's a simple activity that anyone could do. And I'm really big on tactics because that's the type of work that I love to do. But the activity is called Market of Skills. <clears throat> so it's an activity where people create posters about themselves to share with their teammates. And it can really accelerate getting to know uh, each other. So basically what you do is you, you get a poster and you put your name on it. You write the skills you bring to the team. You write your hobbies and interests. You write like, what do you wanna learn in the next three months? And then you write, this is what I offer to teach you. And you can do that in about seven minutes. And then people present their posters. You give them about a minute to present the posters, but you have them listen for certain things. Like what are, what skills do they have that they forgot to mention? What uh, do you think they can teach you that they forgot to mention? So people, it, it becomes interactive and it really accelerates knowing each other. I, I, I tend to tell this story a lot, but it really resonates with me. I remember working uh, with a team and we had a new team member join. And through this activity, we learned that this person was particularly good at uh, taking apart a motorcycle and putting it back together. And that's not a skill that would necessarily come up uh, in, in passing. I mean, it's like a skill slash hobby. And it helped, I think, to raise respect because not, anyone, not just anyone can do that. It's a, it's a unique thing to bring to a team. And you know, so I think what this activity does is it, it allows us to share what we want to share with each other, like things I want you to know about. And these things might not come up in hallway conversation, or it could take a year before you learned that, hey, I've got two Rus Russian tortoises, might not come up. Um, and I do, by the way. <laughs> um, so, so I really like that. And you know, we are whole people at work. It's not uh, work persona, come to work. I really believe that um, being you know, an authentic, trying to come from an authentic approach. You know, we come, I am a mother, I have two children. Uh, you know, I have these tortoises, I do this travel, I, you know. It, 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 we're beyond our formal description of role. I love it. That sounds amazing. So, uh, what are some of the benefits of doing that? Is this just is this helping build more trust, more intimacy? What are you seeing uh, happen when when people use this? Yeah, and and I will mention that you can do this with distributed teams as well. I've done it where people hold up a piece of paper that they have locally, or you can. Uh, type things in a shared doc, for example. Um, but what I think that the outcomes of an activity like this are uh, definitely uh, we find things that we have in common because we'll learn that. And it's always kind of, I'm always kind of curious what's going to, what's going to come up in different teams, but we might learn that we have things in common. Let's say uh, there are a bunch of foodies in the room. So we learn that. And sometimes I have a uh, team member in the room during the activity, make a list of all the things in common. And then sometimes that leads to the teams wanting to have an outing together, maybe to go to lunch or to everyone bring food and, and have a shared kind of potluck for lunch. So it, it brings common ground for sure. I think it also brings respect when we hear about the things that are uh, coworkers can do that we never knew. And especially if we can't do that thing, like take part of mo motorcycle, for example, there's a different type of respect that just kind of takes place. So I think you have the building blocks for 
just really knowing each other. And so later when you face a challenge, uh, you have a little more closeness than you did before. You're less kind of separate. You've shared more with each other. So it's almost like you can see these threads of maybe commonality, but also differences. And just even acknowledging that we're different people, maybe coming from different backgrounds, maybe from different countries. We all have our different stories, which actually leads to another activity that I also learned from Lisa Atkins. She's just, I love her. She's uh, someone that I really respect and admire. She wrote a book called Coaching Agile Teams. And we did some similar coach training from Coaches Training Institute. She has another activity that I've done with teams in the past that's called Journey Lines. Basically, you get a piece of paper and you write your history in like a timeline with the ups and the downs in your life. And everyone gets to choose what they share with their teammates. So you can keep it uh you know, you get to decide, like, what do you want these people to know? These people that you're working on shared work together, you're building things together. And so we can share what we want about our backgrounds. And, and, and so that that's another uh, kind of avenue to get to this kind of respect, knowing each other kind of closeness. When, I really like, I'd really like that because, you know, in 30 years, I've, you get a little profile and usually it's tied to skill set that are you know business oriented and you try to find commonality uh and then there's like this little bottom thing that says oh and by the way this is an interesting thing about me right uh, mm -hmm. this is turning that upside down it's more like hey let's build some intimacy actually get to know each other in a more friendly kind of way in a more mm -hmm. real way more authentic way which i can see how it could certainly make people feel like oh someone else has this thing i like that what are the things are working really well to continue to build trust, to continue to scale teams, to do it in a way that's more effective today versus how it's been done in the past? I describe more of what I call like the imperialistic leadership model in the past, which is all very business oriented. And what you're describing is a little bit more open and a lot more authentic and real. Um, what else is working that, that you share in your book and, and in your experience? Yeah, so I think um, like building relationships um, within teams, but also doing that across teams. So if your company is growing uh, really quickly, what you'll find is that sometimes the teams change. Maybe they grow larger and they split, or maybe they merge together for a particular reason to focus on work with a larger group. Or maybe people go from one team to the next. These are all different kinds of reteaming patterns that might happen. And I you know, through doing this for a while and through being in fast companies, fast growing companies, I've to just really realize that if you focus on that community building, that, you know, get to know each other across larger groups, then later when people switch, it's less of a big deal because they already kind of know each other as humans. So besides doing the activities like I mentioned, and there are others, and there are a lot of 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 wonderful authors of of different activities like this. You don't have to the wheel there. But also having experiences together as a team is important. And at the first two startups that I was at, at both companies, we would do something annually. We called it a tech retreat. And we do overnight trips as teams, as engineering teams, and then engineering and product development teams. And that was really, I think, kind of like the secret sauce for really building uh, friendships and relationships amongst people. Not everyone can kind of go off and uh, take a trip. We would go camping, we would go whitewater rafting. We're in, here in California. We um, did a variety of outdoor activities together as teams, sometimes overnight, we would do that annually. And then sometimes we would do things uh, just for a day trip. We even went to Disneyland once with, with some teams. Uh, due to our proximity and 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 it's expensive and it's an investment but i really um it was really incredible to see how people would really uh get to know each other and band together in those experiences that you know team build team building through screaming i remember being on uh, the tower of terror ride with a some coworkers I didn't know very well. And afterwards, you know, here we are screaming as this, this is a ride that you go up slowly, this like tower, and then the, it drops. 
and people could go on whatever rides they wanted. It's not like everybody must go on that ride. It's just the one I chose. It's the one these people chose. Um, but afterwards we had that shared experience and we could reflect on it later. And we had this kind of shared vantage point. You could do the same thing if you go to a wonderful restaurant or teams would have a cooking event, teams would have Segway. The, some companies uh, give, uh, uh, you know, this, your tribe or your group of teams has this amount of money and it usually could be even tied to a celebration. You can do things that don't cost money that involve uh, going to festivals in your local area, maybe getting out of work a little bit early uh, to, to go to a local uh, celebration or to even go for a walk. I mean, there's a lot of, uh, Woody Zool would tell stories about how at Hunter Industries, they would go on walks and they would have lunch and then they would go walking. I mean, this doesn't cost money, but then it's a shared experience together. And um, so, so having shared experiences together at different degrees, I think, can really help. But then you might wonder, okay, well, Heidi, not everybody has the funding to do that. Not everyone is in the same location, right? So how do we do this when our teams are distributed? And I think more and more, we're, we're really lucky uh, in, in the times that we're living at that screen sharing has become better and better. And uh, so there's, you know, and it's, it's personally exciting to me because, you know, I was on teams that built some of the original screen sharing solutions and uh, right, like go to meeting and, and go to my PC. And, and it, they were really quite revolutionary when, when uh, we were getting started there. And so there's a wide variety of tools like the one we're using right now where we can see people. I rem remember when I was in graduate school uh, many years ago, we had this crude tool called see you, see you, see me. And, you know, I mean, it's just, it's just amazing what we can do now. And especially with tools that allow you to have breakout rooms. So you can have 15 people together, you can break them in groups of two, you can do interactive activities, uh, regardless of location. So you can do activities like market of skills journey lines with these online tools with screen sharing and, and video. Um, you could do virtual get togethers. I remember uh, learning from, from uh, her name escapes me for a moment. Uh, you can have, uh, if you're on distributed teams, you can agree to have lunch together at a certain time with your video. She would have virtual dance parties. She wrote a book about remote work. Uh, uh, Lin Lynette, is that her name? I think her name is escaping me right now. But um, so there you can get kind of get creative and uh, turning on the video is important. I think yeah. uh, if everyone's well, if everyone's comfortable like with that, you know, you have to align on your usage of video. But. Absolutely. Well, it sounds like there's really no no excuse today. I remember 25 years ago at Viacom as a client, and they were trying to build more collaboration between the MTV and VH1 studios between New York and LA. They spent mm. millions of dollars creating those virtual rooms. I mean, it's it's just readily accessible now. It costs nothing. It's amazing how far we've come. So here are the two things I've heard. One. Definitely expose information about yourself, share yourself openly, create a model where people can do that. And two, don't just get to know your coworkers, but actually bond with them, do shared experiences. Uh, I'm gonna pass it back to Marielle, but I do wanna come back to a question on how do you handle conflicts? What happens when conflicts come up? What's been yeah. best practices there? But I, before we get to that question, I wanna give Marielle a chance to ask some yeah. questions. I have a question for Heidi. Uh, well, first off, I would like to point out something that Heidi said, and I think it's, it's really important. Um, she said that whenever we, we, well, companies, they try to bring people together, try to uh, try to make teams to know each other, uh, might be expensive, but it's an investment. And I think not a lot of companies think about it that way. Uh, they might just think about, like, let's give them something to, to make him a little bit happy during their week, and, and that's it. But it's really, really an investment. Um, Continuing with, with, with the topic of, of, of making people like uh, be with each other, get to know each other, what are the most common cultural challenges that you have seen that a team has to overcome in order to grow? Yeah, so what are the... What are, those trust uh, exercises, you know? Say that again? Not everyone's very open to those crazy trust exercises, you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah, it, it, trust falls or something. Yeah, we don't we don't do that. I think I think it's really about kind of set, I think it's really about setting the stage and creating an environment where uh, people can share what they want and they don't have to share what they 
want to share. Um, you know, we are in a professional environment and in the way that you uh, run the activities, you kind of get things started and you provide uh, prompts. And I think starting with something like market of skills is sort of like, these are the skills I bring. These are my hobbies and interests, what I want to learn and what I offer to teach you. There's you know, it, it, it could take a little time to get that information out. I tell people it is going to be quick, though. Uh, don't worry about being perfect. You might forget something that you think you can teach someone. It's OK. So we start with things like that. I know that in uh, Patrick Lencioni, he wrote the book Five Dysfunctions of a Team. And he has a personal histories exercise. I've done this uh, myself with uh, some teams before. And we tell stories about challenges that we have faced in our lives. If you Google uh, Lencioni personal histories, you can see. That's not one that I use that much. I think you need a lot of safety in the room for really digging into people's pasts. I don't, I don't really go there. I, 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 you know, I'll do something like journey lines where people will share experiences and depending on what they want to share, they'll, they'll share different things. And, and so, you know, it really, I think depends on the person. I think it depends how they feel. It depends on, well, how long has that team been together? How well do they know people already? What have they been through already? Sometimes we do the, we do activities to get to know each other better when we've had changes in our lives. I think, um, you know, people are different. People come from different backgrounds. And just, I think facilitation is really important in kind of setting the stage uh, that, you know, people, you inviting people to share, but everyone has the opportunity to share to a de the degree that they want. Um, I don't know if that really answers your question. But. Yeah, thank you. Uh, well, back to Tullius question. What was yeah, your question? Yeah, my question. Well, that, I, I think this is a good uh, build off of that. How do you deal with when conflicts do come up, right? Where, you know, mm -hmm. again, let people be free to participate, opt in or not. Uh, certainly, mm -hmm. I think it's incredibly important. But what happens when conflicts do arise? Into yeah, that's a the company grows, right? It's mm -hmm. just that's what's going to happen. What are some best practices to deal with that that you do? You yeah. Like? So I come from a, my background is in organizational relationships, systems coaching, and also coactive coaching. And I think from both coaching disciplines, one of the uh, stances that we take is that conflict is natural. Conflict is going to happen. So how can you proactively prepare for it? So one of the things that I like to do with teams is like as a part of like if you're coming up with team agreements is to acknowledge that and try to normalize conflict, especially, you know, we're we're solving these problems and we're building the software and we might not always agree and that's OK. So we need to have the ability to disagree respectfully with each other. And sometimes, you know, depending on what's going on, conflict might occur. So what, what I like to do with teams is encourage them to share their preferences for when conflict arises. So for example, when we, we might make a personal list, like if, if we're working together on a team, and this is what I would say to the team, all right, let's say we're working together on the team and I do something that really irritates you and you're very upset with me. These are my preferences for that situation. I would prefer, and this is for real, by the way, <laughs> if you're working with me and this happens, this is my preference. I would prefer that you came to me right away. If a couple weeks pass, there's so much time there that I might not remember the situation. So please come to me as soon as you can and let's take a walk and I would love to hear about it. I would love to, to hear uh, your perspective about it. Uh, some people... Maybe if you're distributed, they would like to, you know, schedule a call and talk about it face to face, you know, through the video. So we, you know, as different people like different things. I was working with a with a team once and they were in a customer success role in a different company and their teammates would overhear sometimes uh, conversations that uh, could sound kind of upsetting. Maybe the customer was upset. And so they had different preferences that they shared with each other 
about how they wanted or didn't want support when that happened. So I remember one team decided, one person decided, okay, if you hear that I'm on a challenging phone call, I'm going to take this, 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 uh, Clorox wipes, right, for cleaning, I'm going to put it on top of my monitor. And if you see that there, it means please give me some space. <laughs> other other teams might be like, if you, if you see me with my headphones on, that's a signal that I really don't want to be disturbed right now. So I think we can share interrupt preferences. We can share preferences when someone might be upset with us for whatever reason. And talking about these in advance is almost like, kind of risk management for conflict. And we realize that that conflict will happen. So so that's try to proactively get ahead of that. So at least then when it happens later, it could be a little bit lighter. Um, but when we but let's say it happens and we didn't catch it, we didn't have the preferences, um, we do need to talk about it. And so sometimes you talk one on one depending on the topic. Sometimes if it's multiple people, you talk together and it's it's helpful to have a coach or a facilitator uh, as well, well sometimes. I really like that. Uh, I, I think it's a great quote. You said Conf conflict is natural. Uh, I think yeah. more organizations need to embrace that. And I like the concept you shared about uh, somehow creating ways to educate everyone around you about boundaries. Like if you know, I just need space right now, don't come talk yeah. to me. I'm putting out a fire, whatever that is, and mm -hmm. just have mutual respect and just upfront, you know, front about the fact that, hey, we're going to have conflict sometimes and it's just life that's just going to happen. Um, we're, we're up on time. Um, and so it's been a great conversation. Is there anything else you want to share with the audience? Uh, any other uh, best practice anecdote along the lines of uh, what we've been discussing before we go? I think I, I I was thinking of one other thing related to conflict. I used I, I I used to think that when I was having a retrospective meeting with a team about how a project went or how uh, a, like how how it was working together, and I used to think it all has to be upbeat, it all has to you know be rosy. And one of the things that I've learned in my career is that uh, when things do get difficult you need to talk about them and at Procore one of the things that crucial conversations and that's a wonderful book about having conversations with people and what you might find is that let's say team situation or one-on-one -on -one situation with another person a lot of the times when we have conflict it usually means that uh, well something went down but we need to talk about it and how can we do that so the books, Nonviolent Communication and Crucial Conversations have very wonderful tips, even syntax that you can use uh, to have a conversation to try to kind of get beyond uh, your conflict with another person. So I think, and you know, we're all humans together and humans, humans have conflict and humans celebrate, humans have wonderful times together. And so, so really kind of acknowledging uh, that we bring the whole person to work, I think, is important. You know, Heidi, I've, I've said to teams in the past, if you're going to have an argument, argue to get to the truth. There you go. Just argue <laughs> to get to the truth. It's not about proving your point. Just argue to get to the truth. Well, it's yeah. been wonderful to have you. I hope uh, people listening in, in here get some great uh, knowledge and, and wisdom that you've shared. I, I love some of the concepts you've shared with us. I think those are fantastic. Thank you. Uh, wish you. A lot of success, Carlos. Uh, I want to. Yeah. Well, I was just about to wrap up. I'm sorry, I've been a little, a little bit silent, but I'm focused on the on quoting in real time. But you're, a lot of the things that you're saying on Twitter, so that that's why I was kind of absent. I'm gonna I, uh, encourage you to stick around for a minute before we go off the air, Heidi. Sure. And the only thing left for me to do is send out a big uh, heartfelt warm thank you for having agreed to be with us again one more time here. On Dojo Live. And so once Ruben yeah. takes the air, please stick around for a minute just to wrap up. Okay. Well, too. Thanks so much. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Until next time. See you next yeah. time. See you next time. Bye.